So I want to begin with two cases from the real world of law. First, first case. In 1944, a woman in Germany wanted to be rid of her husband. He was a German army officer. While he was home on leave, she reported him to the police for making derogatory remarks about Adolf Hitler. He was arrested and charged with making statements inimical, inimical to the welfare of the Third Reich under the law of December 2nd, 1934, and with impairing the defense of the German people under the law of August 17th, 1938. A trial court found him guilty and sentenced him to death. After a period of imprisonment, however, he was sent to the front. I believe it was the Eastern Front, which is practically a sentence of death in uh, 1944. Um, after, uh, so he was sent to the front after the war, Charges were brought against the man's wife and the judge in the case under Section 239 of the German Criminal Code of 1871, which had been continuously in effect. Charges were brought for, quote, unlawful deprivation of another's liberty, uh, I suppose what we would call today false imprisonment. And both were found guilty. On appeal, the judge's conviction was reversed. But the wife's conviction was upheld since she was under no legal obligation, unlike the judge, and freely chose to use against her husband a Nazi law that the appeals court held was, quote, contrary to the social conscience and sense of justice of all decent human beings, unquote, in a judgment of July 27, 1949. This sort of case has happened in many countries in the process of recovering from periods of tyranny. There were a series of these cases after World War II. They're usually called grudge informer cases. Uh, uh, Eastern European countries after the fall of communism, there were similar sorts of cases. And in Iraq, after the fall of Saddam Hussein's government, there were similar cases as well. They highlight a problem. What are one's obligations and liabilities under laws that seem to be unjust? The courts ultimately decided to punish someone who made use of a law that was in force at one time, but later determined to have been unjust. Now, this case does take uh, the issue in a slightly different way than the way that we usually think about it. Usually we think about just uh, about obligations, right? That the question whether one should or must follow an unjust law. And one of the most common ideas associated with the natural law tradition is the thesis that an unjust law is no law at all. It's a very old thesis indeed, for the precise statement of it that I just gave goes back to St. Augustine. It's in his book, uh, De Libero Arbitrio, on free choice of the will, a book one, chapter five, which was written in the late fourth century AD, but there are already versions of it that you can find in Plato. St. Thomas Aquinas adopted Augustine's formulation and he repeated it a number of times in the Summa Theologiae, uh, his greatest systematic work, but also in other works. In the case I just mentioned, there were in fact two laws in force that seemed to be at odds with one another. And the appeals court chose to consider one so unjust as to deprive it entirely of legal force. An unjust law was determined to have been no law at all, as Augustine would have put it. But the more usual case here concerns the violation of a law thought to be unjust and therefore without legal effect. And this leads to my second case, probably more well known to most of you. In early April of 1963, two civil rights organizations launched a campaign of civil disobedience against segregation in Birmingham, Alabama. A state judge issued an injunction against the marchers and other activities that they had planned but the leaders of the campaign announced that they would not comply, that they would defy the ban. On April 12, 1963, Good Friday, as it happened, Martin Luther King, one of the leaders of the protests, was arrested and jailed. While in the jail, King was given a newspaper that contained a quote-unquote call to unity signed by a number of white clergymen who opposed the desegregation campaign. In the margins of that newspaper, he began to compose what eventually became his letter from Birmingham jail of 1963. And here is a se the central statement, I think, from that letter, and that is reproduced as number one on the handout. Uh, King said this, 
One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. He went on. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in the eternal law and the natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. End quote. Was King right about this? It depends in part on how you take his claim. If the claim is simply that unjust laws are not morally binding, then most people, I think, would agree. But he seems to have gone beyond this claim, especially given his citation of Augustine and Aquinas, and asserted not just that the unjust laws are not binding, but that they are not laws. Many people have disagreed with this. They hold that law is one thing and morality something quite different. And so an unjust law is no less law than a just law. And this view is usually called legal positivism. It was, in fact, the dominant view among German legal thinkers before and during the Second World War. Their slogan was, Gesetz ist Gesetz, law is law. Legal positivists hold that it matters that we can determine what, what is law as a human institution independently of whether or not that law is good, bad, just, or unjust. The legal is its own realm and the moral is something separate. Hopefully they intersect, but if they do not, they do not. My remarks this evening are divided into two parts. The first part is concerned with Thomas's understanding of the nature of law, and in the second part, I'll discuss the uh, issue of unjust laws. So the first part, uh, what is law? St. Thomas discusses law in the part of the Summa Theologiae that concerns the principles or causes of human actions in general. And he conceives of human beings here as images of God, insofar as they have the powers of intellect and free choice. So in one sense, human beings are themselves the principles of their own acts. But what explains those acts themselves? He holds that the principles of human action can be classified according to whether those acts are good or bad. The principle of good acts, principles of good acts, are either internal to human beings or external to human beings. The internal principles are aspects of human nature that bear on action. For example, habits that dispose us to act in one manner rather than in another. Good actions also have an extrinsic principle, Thomas wrote. And Aquinas says that that extrinsic principle is God who instructs us by his law and assists us by his grace. That's in uh, the Prima Secundae, the first part of the second part of the Summa Theologiae, question 90 uh, in the prologue. Now, two points here are crucial. First, law is in the first instance instructive, educational. Law as such, in the most general sense, is not just for Thomas about keeping people from killing each other, but about educating them. Second, for Aquinas, law has its origin and cause in God. In both respects, Aquinas' understanding of law is quite different from most modern views. To understand why Thomas takes this view, we need to look at his rather famous definition of law in the Summa Theologiae. Uh, and that's in, uh, the first, again, the Prima Secundae, the first part of the second part of the Summa, question 90. Uh, and that definition is number two on the, on the handout there. Um, Thomas defines law as an ordinance of reason directed to the common good by whoever has the care of the community and promulgated. Now, there are several things we should notice about that definition. First, there are four elements. 
the ordinance of reason directed to the common good by whoever has the care of the community and promulgated. Pro probably he's referring to Aristotle's account of the four forms of causality in the second book of the physics, which means uh, I think it's intended to be a pretty serious definition, not, not just a kind of uh, loose definition, but, but really quite uh, precise. The first element, which would be the formal cause on Aristotle's account, I think, is that law is an ordinance of reason. Thomas says in Latin, an ordinatio rationis. So Thomas first associates law with reason. Now, the most typical positivist view of law associates it with will. For example, Thomas Hobbes, who in his Leviathan, published in 1651, even before the founding of this university, believe it or not, um, Leviathan, as a command of the sovereign, or John Austin, who wrote a little later in 1832, who had essentially the same understanding of law, that it's primarily an act of will. Thomas does not use the word command, however, but the word ordination, ordinatio, rooted in the word order, but not specifically tied to the will. Moreover, it is an ordination of reason. Why reason? Because reason is the principle of human action. That word is always used in translations of Thomas, that word principle, we hear that word, I think usually we think about a rule. We think of a principle as a kind of rule. But in Latin, it's the word principium, which is Thomas's translation of Aristotle's word arche, which is often translated as first principle, but the basic root meaning of which is simply starting point. And arche is a beginning, right? So archaeology is the science of really, really old things uh, because uh, it's about the starting points. So that term principle in Thomas's sense can mean origin or sometimes even cause. So here Thomas's idea seems to be that reason is what explains human action. That is, we act for reasons. Human beings are beings that act for reasons. So human actions are intelligible by reference to reasons and therefore evaluated by reference to reasons. Good actions are actions undertaken for good reasons. So laws that govern human actions are also related to reason. Indeed, they often function as a kind of substitute reason in that in a person's action, in that a person's action can sometimes simply be explained, be explained by saying that it aims to obey the law. A good answer to the question, why did you stop when the light turned red, is because it is the law. We treat laws as reasons for action, or inaction in some cases. But we would only be right to do that if law really is related to reason. The second element of the definition is the common good, which constitutes the final cause among those four causes, the final cause or end of law. Now, this can mean something quite simple and obvious, but also something a bit more complex and controversial. The simple and obvious meaning, which goes back to the classical Greeks, is that law and political institutions and practices more generally should be for the good of everyone in the community and not just the good of the rulers. Now, this seems pretty unremarkable. So we need also to consider a slightly more complex and even controversial meaning of the term. But this is also connected to the first element of the definition. Human beings act for reasons, but those reasons are goods. They take the form of goods. Thomas is an Aristotelian. Many of you probably read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, so you know the first sentence by heart. Every action and choice is for the sake of some good. Uh, and uh, Thomas repeats that formulation many, many times. So reasons often take the form of goods. Thomas, like Aristotle, holds that every action and choice is for the sake of some good, and the quality of goodness itself indicates desirability. We desire what we do not have. We desire what we lack. We desire what fulfills and perfects us, often in small, finite ways, but ultimately also in much bigger ways. Most of the discrete goods that we act for are for the sake of others, and some of those others have a kind of ultimacy in that we don't immediately desire them for any reason beyond them. Such goods are correlated to natural human powers, and Thomas holds that they are the first principles of human action. They include things like life, marriage and children, knowledge, 
and social life, among others. But there is also an ultimate good that those goods participate in. Uh, and that ultimate good, Thomas calls happiness or beatitude. Insofar as happiness or beatitude name the complete fullness or perfection of human beings as such, and therefore the fullness and perfection of all individual human persons, happiness or beatitude is the common good. That is to say, the good common to all human persons. But how is this related to law? Does law, does following the law necessarily lead one to happiness? Does it make us happy? Not quite, I don't think. This is why Thomas follows his discussion of happiness with his discussion of the sense in which individual persons can be seen as parts of a whole. I mean, and the first part of it about happiness is the fourth uh, quotation on the sheet here in the business I'm talking about now, but parts and wholes is, is actually the fifth. In what sense is the political community a whole? Thomas, again, following Aristotle, sometimes calls the political community a perfect community, communitas perfecta. By this, he does not mean something like the best community or the community greater than which cannot be conceived. Rather, he means a community that is complete in that it contains within itself all that is necessary for human beings to flourish. That is, all that is necessary for human persons to pursue happiness and hopefully to be happy. The family, for example, does not contain all of these things, but only some. Human persons are parts of this community because they are partial or incomplete on their own. Their happiness cannot be achieved without the help and companionship of other persons. And when persons live together, there is a necessary order to their common life. The most characteristic component of that order is law, especially when the community is large compared to something small like the family, which it must be if it is to contain all the ingredients necessary for human beings to pursue flourishing lives. It has to be large if that's what the purpose of it is. The political community provides the necessary context for flourishing human life, and it must itself reflect that flourishing in its order. At a minimum, it must provide justice and peace. The partiality of persons relative to political community reflects their need for political community as an element of their own flourishing and the need for them to contribute to its maintenance and improvement. To say that law aims at the common good is to say that law is a means to these things. That is, to human flourishing and to the maintenance of the conditions necessary for human flourishing. The third element of Thomas's definition of law is that law is made by whoever has the care of the community. This is the efficient cause of law. It is made by those charged with minding the community's business. And we ordinarily call that the government. The nature of government in its most general sense includes a lot more for Thomas, however, than we ordinarily think. The full scope of that will become clear a bit later, but for now, it's enough to say that in a specifically human context, Thomas thinks law is, ne is necessarily made by civil government and not by private individuals. This is partly because, because coercion of one person by another can only be justified by law and thus only by the authority of government for the sake of the common good. Now, not all laws coerce. And even those that can be enforced coercively aren't so enforced most of the time. In other words, most of the time people comply with laws on their own. They don't need to be coerced. But the possibility of coercion is underwritten by the common good of the community, that is, by the good of everyone. Even where coercion is not explicitly involved, the law claims to direct people in place of their own judgment acting, as I said earlier, as a kind of substitute reason. This is a very serious claim, since human beings are characterized by Thomas as images of God precisely in their ability to command themselves, to be the causes of their own acts through free, deliberate choice. That aspect of human nature can only be limited or taken away in the name of genuine human good, 
And so Thomas holds that law can only be made by the whole community or the community's lawful representatives. Finally, Thomas says law must be promulgated. I think that's the material cause. If law is a kind of reason that measures and rules human actions, then the humans ruled by it must know what it is. One cannot hold persons responsible for what they do not know. This may seem like an obvious point, but there have been regimes that arrested and imprisoned citizens for violations of secret laws. That happened in Nazi Germany. You could be arrested and they could put you in jail and you could say, what am I being charged with? And they could say, it's a secret. Uh, and so that has happened. The necessity of promulgation probably also reflects what we ordinarily take to be the injustice of retroactive criminal pros pro uh, prosecution, right? Prosecuting somebody for something that wasn't a crime at the time they did it, that only became one later on. That's prohibited by our constitution. So laws are ordinances of reason directed to the common good by whoever has the care of the community and promulgated. Now I want to come back to that issue of government that I said earlier was more complicated than it looks. I want to make two related points about government that lie behind Thomas's point about the efficient cause of the law. The, the uh, people who have the care of the community making it. The first point can be seen by noting what is not an explicit, what is not an explicit and independent element in Thomas's definition of law, namely punishment. Thomas does mention the issue of coercion in explaining why only public authority can make law, but he does not make sanctions an element of his definition of law. Rather, he describes it as one of the acts of law, along with commanding, forbidding, and permitting in question 92, article two. Most of the classical legal positivists, Hobbes again, John Austin, Oliver Wendell Holmes, made sanctions crucial parts of their definitions of law. So why didn't Thomas? First, for the reason, seemingly obvious, but only really first stressed by, in legal philosophy by H.L.A. Hart, the great 20th century English legal philosopher, that not all laws carry sanctions. In fact, most laws lack sanctions. Think about the laws of contract, wills, trusts, and estates, administrative law, constitutional law. Most of what constitutes the laws of modern countries don't have any sanctions in them at all. Beyond this, there's another reason. Because we can imagine a whole human community that lacked coercive law, as Aquinas does, in the prima pars, the first part of the Summa Theologiae, when he asks there, if there would have been rule by some human beings over others without original sin. Now, while St. Augustine is often interpreted as having held that government itself is a consequence of sin and wouldn't have existed otherwise, I mean, he's often interpreted that way. I think that's probably not right, but that is the way he's often interpreted. Thomas explicitly denies this. Even in a society of completely virtuous persons, there would still need to be direction to a common end, a common good a coordination of actions and functions directed to the common good. Now, without sin, the command would be all that was necessary. There would be no need for punishment. So we can imagine a society of law that is entirely, you might say, directive, but not coercive. We don't live in that society, unfortunately, but we can understand it. Government need not entail coercion, although in our post-lapsarian condition, it does and must. What is necessary is rational government, direction to the common good. The notion of rational government is essential to my second point, which opens up another broad aspect of Thomas's understanding of law. Immediately after giving his definition of law, Thomas writes that there are four kinds of law. This is in question 91. And uh, those four kinds of law, uh, three of them at any rate, are described in uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10 uh, on the handout there. Each of them has the four features of Thomas's basic definition. What distinguishes them is most immediately related to the fourth element, promulgation. That is, those four kinds of law, I mean, the main difference among them has to do with how they're promulgated. Eternal law, natural law, human law, and divine law 
are each really and fully law on Thomas's view, but they're promulgated in quite distinct ways. Now, the most difficult to understand is surely the first. How can an eternal law be promulgated if there have not been people who were eternal to receive it? Certainly not human beings. Thomas means by eternal law, the government of the entire cosmos by God's own reason. This government is mostly effected through creation itself. God created each thing with a certain nature, which includes its powers and the acts and objects of these powers. So the very principle of each thing's operation, whether inanimate, vegetable, animal, or human being. The divine government then follows mainly from creation, from the way things were created at the beginning, which itself came from the divine reason, which is as eternal as God. But how is this promulgated? This brings us to the second kind of law, the natural law. The eternal law is promulgated to human beings, according to Thomas, through the natural law. Since the natural law is, Thomas writes, the rational creature's participation in eternal law. Human beings were given through creation a rational nature and the power of free choice. We participate in God's providence in a special way through free choice. Unlike other beings, the natural law is simply Thomas's way of describing man's practical moral reasoning. Now recall where we began. Human beings act for ends, and some of those ends are more basic because they are the objects of our distinct powers, powers that we have because of the nature with which God created us. The eternal law then is promulgated through our knowledge of and inclination towards the goods we reasonably pursue. These goods are the starting points and the principles, the starting points of our practical reasoning. Our inclination to them is the working of the eternal law, and our knowledge of them is, Thomas says, the natural law. In his famous discussion of the precepts of the natural law, Thomas emphasizes certain precepts and goods that especially concern survival. We have certain inclinations common to all beings to continue in being and so directed to the good of life. We have certain inclinations common to animals to continue the being of their species, and so directed to the goods of marriage and children. And we have certain inclinations unique to rational nature and the being, uh, and the being of distinctly rational life, and so to the goods of knowledge and life in community. These goods justify the basic moral rules most prominently for St. Thomas, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which he says are precepts of the natural law. The common life of a particular people must be regulated by common rules, but many matters of ordinary community life are not definitively settled by the precepts of the natural law. Moreover, the natural law does not, as it were, enforce itself. So human laws, Laws drafted and promulgated by public authority are also necessary. For example, the natural law includes precepts that concern the protection of human life, some of which follow directly and immediately from natural law precepts, like the precept against murder. But there are other threats to human life. For example, automobiles, large hunks of metal hurtling down paved highways at high rates of speed, are very, very dangerous, and so their use must be regulated in a way that protects human life. There must be rules of the road. Now, accidents can be avoided if roads are divided, and drivers required to use one side to travel one direction and the other side to travel in the opposite direction. But which should be which? The natural law does not provide a ready answer. So the public authority, the legislature, chooses and that choice becomes a reason for the whole community. One must drive on the right side of the road in most of the world. This connection between natural law and human positive law 
brings us then to the issue of justice or injustice in law. So this is my second uh, part. The distinction I alluded to between human laws that follow directly from precepts of the natural law and those that specify natural law precepts that are too general is quite important for understanding Aquinas' view. In question 95, article two of the treatise on law, and that's uh, number 10 there on the handout, it's a longish text. I'm not gonna read it verbatim, but. Uh, in that text, Thomas asks if every human law is derived from the natural law. The answer is yes. Although the derivation takes two different forms, one is where the human law follows the natural law, Thomas says, like a conclusion follows a premise in a demonstrative argument. So the natural law prohibits most killing and the human law makes murder a crime. A second way that this happens, however, is, uh, is like the case that I talked about above related to traffic law. Here the natural law states a general premise that must be specified by human law. The important thing here is that in both cases, in both cases, Thomas thinks the human law is ultimately derived from the natural law. The most important aspect of this is that since all human laws derive from the natural law, there is a moral obligation, a natural law obligation to obey the human law. This is a crucial point and distinguishes Thomas from most contemporary legal and political philosophers, since most of them deny that there is any general moral obligation to obey human laws. For Aquinas, the human law is underwritten by the natural law, which is the rational creature's participation in the eternal law. This means that human law is actually underwritten by the eternal law, by God's own providential government of things. I wanna make two points about this conclusion, one about its rationale and another about its implications. First, again, it is important to remember that the basic view that there is a general obligation to obey the law is a minority view today. Contemporary thinkers have tried various arguments to establish such an obligation. Versions of utilitarianism, social contract theory, the so-called argument from fair play, but there has been no general agreement on the vindication of any one of these, and skeptics have tended to predominate about all of them. There is a sense in which this is just what we should expect, given the character of the modern arguments. The great 20th century French Thomist, Yves Simon, has an illuminating discussion of this problem in his 1951 book, Philosophy of Democratic Government. There he asks, how is it possible for one or even many human beings to bind the consciences of other human beings? His answer is that it is not. Only God can bind any human being in conscience. And this is exactly Thomas's view. In question 96, article four of the Summa, of the, uh, of the Prima Secundae, the treatise on law, Thomas asks whether human laws bind a human being in what he calls the court of conscience. And his basic answer is that yes, human law can bind in conscience, but only because, as he says, quote, if just human laws receive their power to bind in the court of conscience from the eternal law. So just human laws are binding on human beings as a matter of conscience, meaning morally one is obligated to obey them because of the eternal law. He goes on to classify the senses in which human laws can be just or unjust. This is assessed by reference to three features of laws, and uh, this is uh, quotation uh, number 11. Again, a kind of longish quotation there. I'm just summarizing it. Three different features. He says the law's end, its author, and its form. And we need to look at each of these aspects. First, the end. Recall that the final cause or end of law is the common good. That was the, in Thomas's own definition. So just laws aim at the common good. Laws that aim at the private good of the rulers or some faction are unjust in their ends. Second, 
Laws are unjust if they are made by someone or somebody lacking the authority to make the law in question. So that, that's where it's unjust relative to its author. In practice, cases of this kind usually rest on provisions of the community's constitutional law, since that defines the powers of the various parts of the government. An example here would be, for example, all the litigation that occurred uh, after the uh, uh, reform of health care, the Affordable Care Act in 2011. Most of that uh, litigation concerned the constitutionality of various parts of that law and whether or not uh, Congress had the power to do those things or whether or not parts of the executive branch of the government had the power to do those things. Third, a law can be unjust in its form, Thomas says. It's unjust in its form if burdens imposed on citizens are unequal or disproportionate relative to the common good. And I think this is the most common kind of injustice in law. And this would include the kind of injustice that was targeted, for example, by Martin Luther King in the letter from Birmingham jail that I talked about in the beginning. In thinking about this kind of injustice, it's also helpful to consider Thomas's larger account of justice itself, which is treated later in the Summa Theologiae in the second part uh, of the second part. Justice is first and foremost a virtue for St. Thomas a moral virtue consisting of what he calls, quote, a perpetual will to give to each his due, unquote. The word translated there as due in Latin is jus, which is the root of the word justice, obviously, and it can also be translated and often is translated as right. Most of what one is due, most of what one has a right to, is a matter of positive law, of human law. But some of it is also a function of the natural law what Thomas sometimes calls natural right, natural right. This includes things to which any human person is entitled. For example, respect for one's life, the right to found a family and raise one's own children, the right not to be lied to, and other things. Unjust laws fail in form in that third way, primarily because they deny persons what they are due or require of them things that they do not owe. Back in the question on whether human laws bind in conscience, Thomas distinguishes between unjust laws that are contrary to human good and those that are contrary to the divine good. The former, the ones that are contrary to human good, he says, are unjust in the three ways stated already. And Thomas says that they are accordingly, quote, more acts of violence than law. Unquote. And he quotes Aquinas' judgment that, quote, a law that is not just seems to be no law at all, unquote. Such laws do not bind in conscience, except, Thomas says, in an important qualification, quote, perhaps in order to avoid scandal or disturbance for which a man should give up even what is rightly his, unquote. The force of the qualification is best understood in light of the other category of unjust laws, those that are contrary to divine good. These are laws that are contrary to divine law, human laws contrary to divine law. Now, earlier I said that Aquinas described four kinds of law, but I only discussed very briefly the eternal, the natural, and the human law. The fourth type, divine law, is the law that God explicitly reveals to human beings and includes both the old law, the law of Moses contained in the Hebrew Bible, and the new law, the law revealed by Jesus Christ himself and through the church. For Thomas, the natural law requires that God be honored as a matter of justice, but the natural law does not say how God is to be honored. The Mosaic law instructed the Jews about proper worship. Christians are instructed in this by Christ as interpreted by the church, for example, in the establishment of the Eucharist and the obligation of the faithful to participate in that sacrifice on the Sabbath and other holy days. Any human law contrary to divine law must, Thomas says, be disobeyed. And I think that, in fact, I'm certain that Thomas includes in this 
in the category of divine law here, he includes the natural law as well, since the question asks specifically about the binding power of human law. For purposes of that discussion, the natural law is part of the divine law, especially since God revealed parts of the natural law in the divine law. Again, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, are both precepts of the natural law, Thomas says, but they were also revealed by God himself. So no one should obey any law enjoining them to do what is morally wrong or prohibiting them from doing what is morally obligatory. I want to underline two points about this discussion. One concerning the character of unjust laws, the other concerning the sense in which one might still be obligated to obey some unjust laws. As I said, Thomas quotes Augustine's statement that an unjust law seems to be no law at all. And this is not the only time he cites that passage and not the only formulation he uses. Earlier in the treatise, he writes that tyrannical law, quote, because not according to reason, is not strictly speaking law, but rather a kind of perversion of law, unquote. A bit later, considering the possibility of human laws that are wicked, he writes that such an unjust law, quote, in so far as it departs from reason, is called a wicked law, and so has not the character of law, unquote, but a, a, not the character of law, but of violence, unquote. In his discussion of the derivation of human law from natural law, Thomas repeats the quotation from Augustine and then concludes on the basis of it, quote, hence a command that has the force of law, command has the force of law insofar as it is just, unquote. Now this last formulation is particularly important because in it Aquinas does not just quote Augustine, but interprets him. And his interpretation of the statement that an unjust law is not a law is that such a law lacks the force of law. That is another way of saying that it does not bind one in conscience. Thomas does not deny that there are unjust laws in the sense of rules made in the ordinary way that present themselves as valid and therefore obligatory. He denies that they are obligatory. Because they are unjust, they fail to be laws in the full normative sense. That is, they fail to be ordinances of reason directed to the common good by those who have the care of the community and promulgated. Laws that are irrational, opposed to the common good, made by those who lack the authority to legislate or are not promulgated, fail to bind. Why do they fail to bind? Because they either contradict precepts of the natural law or they fail to licitly specify precepts of the natural law and thereby fail to participate in the eternal law, lacking the only authority that can bind the conscience of a human being, God's authority. But there is, and this is my second point, the qualification that Thomas carefully makes. Recall that Thomas says that one is not bound in conscience to obey a law that is unjust in being at odds with the human good, except, quote, perhaps in order to avoid scandal or disturbance, for which a man should give up even what is rightfully his, unquote. In that same article, Thomas also wrote that, writes that, quote, a man is not obliged to obey the law in such cases if he can resist doing so without scandal or worse, harm, unquote. The point is repeated in other places in the Summa Theologiae as well, at least uh, three other places. One should obey even unjust laws under certain conditions. The obedience here, however, is of a distinct sort. It is not so much obedience to the law itself, for that law has no binding force. It is rather a disposition to, avi to avoid certain consequences of disobeying even an unjust law. It could best be described as a collateral obligation not to give scandal, and to avoid other disturbances to public life, or even certain private consequences. By scandal, Thomas means that one's action could encourage another person to violate the law, even a just law. They see one person violating an unjust law, don't have all the prudence that that person might have, and then think it's okay to disobey whatever law that, that they like, right? That's the danger. So the fact that a law is unjust does not automatically mean that one can ignore it. 
Now, in the case of, of a law that's unjust because it goes against the divine good, Thomas says that's very clear. One has to disobey it. This, in, in this case, he's talking about laws that go against the human good. Now, two additional points about this. First, of course, if the law is unjust in opposing the divine good, that is an obligation in natural law or divine law, then one is bound to disobey. If the law is unjust in opposing human good in the three ways that Thomas distinguished, that is, with respect to its end, its author, or its form, then one must make a decision, informed by prudence, about whether one should or should not obey. One must weigh the dangers of scandal or other disruptions against the evil of the unjust law in question. What kind of considerations are relevant? Here are two examples. My university is located in Washington, DC, which currently has an indoor mask mandate among measures taken to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. I have heard people on campus, a small number of people, but I've heard them, insist that the mask mandate is unjust and not persuasively supported by scientific evidence. Some have taken the position that they are not obligated to comply with it. Now leave aside whether they're right about the matter and assume they're acting in good faith. I think Thomas's account suggests that even one who holds this view should comply. The mandate is not opposed to the divine good. If it is unjust, it is unjust because it is the result of public officials acting beyond their reasoned authority. That is to say, in the second way that Thomas mentioned, unjust with respect to their author. Disobedience might well encourage disobedience to other laws or public health regulations. And that disobedience could, be, could have serious consequences. My second example takes us back to one of the two examples with which I began. Many civil rights activists intentionally violated segregation laws in the 1950s and 60s as a way of calling attention to their injustice and of encouraging their reform. Assume the laws were duly enacted. Was disobedience justified? Was Martin Luther King acting justly? I think he was. Those laws probably were opposed to the human good in all three ways that Thomas distinguished. They were un, uh, in the interest of the private good of some persons and not for the common good. They were unconstitutional and therefore beyond the authority of lawmakers. And they certainly laid unequal burdens on citizens for no good reason. Indeed, one could make the case that they also opposed the divine good insofar as they may well have opposed, probably opposed, elements of the natural moral law, but that is to say by being substantively unjust. Given the weight of all that, it seems to me that King and many other civil rights activists who engaged in acts of civil disobedience were justified, and their actions led to our having ultimately a more just country. So, and this is my very brief conclusion, the binding authority of law, according to Aquinas, is rooted in the eternal law, part of which human beings know through reason. Unjust laws cut that root and are unreasonable and therefore lack binding authority. In this crucial sense, they fail to be laws in the full sense of the term. And this is the meaning of the phrase, an unjust law is no law at all. Thank you. Actually, I uh, have two full questions. Let me start over. First, um, like, so with laws it, uh, that are, there, there's a difference between how the law is in, uh, so be ordinarily expected to be enforced and how the law is actually written. Um, what is the moral obligation there with my first one question? For example, um, speed limit laws, in which it is more ordinarily expected for the law to only be enforced above five, you know, speeding by five miles, right? Or jaywalking, in which obviously you know jaywalking is illegal, but it's not ordinarily expected to be enforced. What what is the moral obligation there? Yeah, I, I think um, clearly there's some kind of moral obligation to obey all of those laws. Um, I think it's not. The, I I think um, the moral. So there's an interesting distinction here that one can make. You know, from the law's perspective. <laughs> That is to say, when the law presents itself, right, 
Interestingly, there is no variation in the force of moral obligation. So here, this sounds crazy, but I think this is actually correct. It's no more illegal to steal, it's, it's, no, it's no more illegal to commit murder than it is to steal a candy bar. Right? In the sense that from the law's perspective, there's just legal and illegal. And it's either one or the other. But the question of one's moral obligation to obey the law is a bit different. And there, I think you can talk about gravity being greater in some cases and lesser in other cases. Obviously, the gravity of murder is vastly greater than the gravity of stealing a candy bar, even though both things are equally illegal. And so, I mean, I think there is a moral obligation to obey the speed limit and to obey the, uh, the rules about pedestrian a business, but I think the gravity of not obeying those laws is much, much smaller than the gravity of obeying others, in part because of public expectations and the way other people behave and so forth, right? You're not, you know, by driving over the speed limit, you're in fact not really giving scandal because how could you? There's 150 other people doing it in the immediate vicinity or the, the, you know, the jaywalking business. But there still is a moral obligation there and there's a reason for those laws. Um, I used to live in a place where there was a very crowded intersection and about every, every three, few years, a pedestrian would get killed or seriously injured jaywalking. And then the police would kind of swoop in and for a couple of weeks, they'd kind of set up shop there and they'd literally write tickets to pedestrians who jaywalked. And after a few weeks, they'd give up and they, you know, the lesson was, was there for a while. But then a few years would go by and, right, uh, that's the way they treated it, right? They have more serious things to do. So, um, I mean, I would say there's a kind of variability to that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So while the moral, obli moral obligation for is is lower than some of the higher law, even even the most minor or superfluous laws, still without themselves. So. Yeah, and by, so I would not say there's no moral obligation to obey them. I think there is. I, I just think it's not morally the gravity of it is a lot less than than other laws. Yeah, and. So, because I, uh, I have a question that uh, uh, I, I think that the, 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 the society on uh, just the law is not, is not what I thought. I think it's, um, I have heard this many, many years ago when I was uh, not a, just a university student. But now, the reason I find that it seems quite, it seems quite, it seems quite, um, quite knowledgeable, quite, yes. Yeah, it really makes sense, uh, no problem. But I found that uh, actually it's um, to some de to some degree it's just uh, just a some just some illusion in that. Yeah. Also, also we all know we all think it's uh, they, we all take it for granted in that. But actually, it's just an illusion because in a practical in the in the, uh, in the daily life of uh, any country, yeah, you will find that uh, in fact, yeah. Mm, I, I don't want to say uh, I don't say all the time, but I would I would say uh, most of the time, actually it's not actually it's just it's just uh, just uh, maybe some some doctrine some some principle in book, but in, in the reality, yeah even they even uh, even United States uh, yeah, they, uh, still actually it's, it's not it's not like that that's there what they said actually it's not yeah, in in reality actually you will find that uh, even the most liberal. Uh, most liberal country you find that actually even the law is uh, the law is uh, just uh, on justice. It's not important. The most important is yeah, which law, which the uh, which there, there must be some 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 law, some uh, some fixed law, some uh, some valid law. People can yeah, everybody, all the people can uh, just uh, obey them. This is my and also it's, it's also my one of my recent recent research. Yeah, you will find that yeah, no matter no matter uh, no matter previous originally there are all kinds of uh, issues of all kinds of uh, some uh, some dispute disputes, but you will find that uh, finally yeah definitely just uh, nobody there's you no know, some some arguments about uh, this law was or not this uh, this law unjust or unjust yeah there must be have some results. So this is called uh, this is called a uh, I'd like to use a uh, political science. Uh, uh, it's called the sovereignty. Excuse me. Sovereign sovereignty. Yeah. 
sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is in Kongji. Yeah, it, 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 is a, it is really a Kongji. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of software. Otherwise, this Kongji will be in the shut down. Yeah, okay. Now, I may not fully, I'm not sure I fully understand your point, but I think maybe because of what the last thing you said, but you tell me if I've got it right or not, that this claim that an unjust law is not a law is somehow, it doesn't fit with the notion of sovereignty it, as most countries understand it? Or? I mean, uh, this, uh, this I'm just the law is not a law at all. Yeah, yeah you can, we can just make some academic, uh, all kinds of academic uh, arguments, no problem. But yeah. in, the, in, the, in the reality, in legal reality, you know, even the most liberal and the most religious country, yeah, still at last, finally, yeah, nobody will, nobody will care about the laws group of bread. Mm. Yeah. After all, yeah, the most important, we should finally, we should get, we should get a result. Just, just resolve it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that notion of sovereignty uh, is, is quite important. And I think Thomas would actually reject it. Um, because as it's, as it's understood in modern times, um, right as a kind of absolute authority on the part of territorial states uh, to make laws, to enforce laws, to do things in their own territories, right? Uh, again, it's a modern idea, and I, th I think he would reject it. I think he would think, ultimately, there's only one sovereignty, and that's God's sovereignty. And the sovereignty claimed by countries, I mean, it, the, I mean, there's a sort of truth about it, and then there's a sort of extreme claim, right? The truth about it is simply that, that, that to say each country is sovereign in its own territory, I mean, what's without question true about that is that some authority is responsible for what goes on in that territory. And there's got to be some way to assess responsibility, to say that certain people are responsible. And governments are responsible within the territories that that they claim sovereignty over. But, but to say that that claim of sovereignty really is a kind of unlimited authority to make laws and other uh, uses of coercion and so forth, he, he simply would reject because no human being or no human organization has that kind of power. It's all ultimately derived from the natural moral law and ultimately from the eternal law. So the modern notion of sovereignty, I think he would simply reject. <clears throat> uh, uh, in, in one word, uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, uh, so actually, most of the time, the, 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 when we say that I'm just a law, not a law at all, is, uh, can be considered as the liberal, liberal, liberalism, or libertarianism. Hey, what? Libertarianism. Oh, libertarianism. Or liberal, liberalism. Liberalism. Or liberal, yeah, really. Okay, that doesn't matter. So, so I, I, what I want to point out is that uh, actually many, many people has uh, some misunderstanding about it. We just uh, think about, oh, take it for granted, oh, liberalism. So let's call it liberty. Okay? Freedom. Freedom or liberty. Actually, that is just some, um, it's like the, like the title. It's just some um, some morality, morality in a morality sense. Yeah, we talk about no problem. Yeah? As a morality, okay, liberty, freedom, no, no problem. But if we just if we want to put it into some uh, political science, political science, okay, attention please. It's not morality, political science. You will find that uh, it's not it's not it's not true. Yeah, well, we'd have to talk about the nature of political science, I suppose. I mean, for Thomas, who's an Aristotelian, uh, the real political science is the knowledge that statesmen use in governing the communities that they govern. So it's a kind of application of prudence. And it's not theoretical. It's a practical science. It's not a theoretical science. Modern political science is, in fact, a kind of theoretical science, which, which Thomas wouldn't wouldn't recognize, uh, nor, nor would Aristotle. Um, and since it's an application of prudence, since it's a practical science, it's ultimately governed by the natural law. And, you know, so there is no morally neutral political science on Aquinas's view. 
Um, political science is a master craft of a legislator or a governor in applying prudence, including the natural moral law, to human affairs, um, which I think is quite different from, from the way that we understand it as a kind of modern academic discipline. It's, it's yeah, quite different, I think. Any other questions? Uh, we've been talking about uh, this at the level of like governments as you get kind of quote like into smaller and smaller regions, so like universities or your parish pastor or the homeowners association in the neighborhood. Like, does the same logic apply for those as laws, or do things become rules and not laws in some way? Or, um, you know, so if the pastor says, you can't wear shorts to mass, or the university says, no eating or drinking in the classroom, um, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, like, I guess, how does, how does that all function? Does it function in the same way as, as the government, basically? Um, uh, it, I mean, it... It depends on what you're talking about, right? So in one sense, um, no. If you're not talking about a, a government in the proper sense, right? Because again, for Thomas, even though uh, punishment and sanctions is not part of his literal definition of law, he does understand that coercion is an act of law. And while there are rules and regulations that are practical and ultimately related in some ways to the natural law and so forth, in sort of non-governmental organizations like universities, they typically don't have the power to engage in coercion, right? So, I mean, I sometimes like to tell students, you know, if, if you disobey the dean, um, you know, he doesn't have a dungeon below the building. He can't put anybody down there. He's, he doesn't have that power. He can't coerce you. Only the, you know, the Metropolitan Police Department can coerce you and they're not going to do it because the dean made, made you made the dean mad. I mean, um, they're going to do it because you broke a law or something like that. So. You know, you, on the other hand, um, there are the elements of law that are not strictly coercive that are relevant. I mean, a university is chartered as a public institution. And so when students or faculty become associated with the university, they enter into a contractual relationship with an organization and they have contractual obligations and contractual rights, which can be enforced by a court, even though they're not public laws, you know, even private rules and regulations are kind of adopted as public laws insofar as they can be enforced at a court, which they can be. In, in the specific case of pastors and the church, of course, well, we're talking there about canon law. And the canonical system is a legal system. Uh, in fact, a quite old legal system. And it's an interesting question how you explain it in Thomas's terms, because he doesn't have much to say about canon law explicitly. I mean, there are if you read through the treatise on law, you'll find footnotes that refer, for example, to Gratian or to some explicit acts of canon law from the Middle Ages and so forth. But he doesn't talk about it in a kind of theoretical way. Uh, so, uh, you know, what is it then? You know, and I, I mean, I think for the most part, it's human law that exists because of the divine law. And uh, like all human law, it, it, it copies parts of the natural moral law and, and also parts of the divine law. But I think most of the content of it is human law in a sense. And, um, but but is, there, is there any coercion there? Yes, but of a very peculiar kind, right? I mean, you, you can, you know, certain things can happen to you within the church, um, but they don't put you in prison or anything like that. You're sort of excluded from that community on, on the basis of it. So, um, so in some ways, it, some of the things are the same, but some of them are different too, I think. Does that make sense? Or? Yes, I mean, I mean, I guess like those laws, generally speaking, laws made by like the university or rules made by the homeowners association. If you kind of like you by being there, they're kind of contracted in, and it's generally considered morally binding in a similar way as government laws. Do you think is that? Yeah, and and it's it's mostly voluntary, right? I mean, you right and, and when I signed the you know. Uh, uh, the papers at the closing on my house, I mean, which was the second scariest thing I've ever done. Uh, <laughs> the first was witnessing the birth of my children. The second one was this, they brought this, I mean, there were like six lawyers and they brought out this stack of paper like this and I, um, it was terrifying. Um, uh, 
But a lot of that stuff you're signing, you're, you're promising to go along with various sets of rules, including the, the homeowners association, among other things. Um, and, and so you, you've, you've made a contract at that point. <clears throat> yeah. Now, political society is not a society that, that you become a member of as a result of a contract, um, right? You're either born into it uh, or you become a, intentionally a part of it. But even people who don't do either of those things are still obligated. I mean, if you're just visiting a country, you still have to obey their laws. And it's because of uh, the position that governments hold in view of the common good of the communities that they exist for. Um, so that is unique, I think. I mean, that really is distinctive. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you were talking about how we have like a moral obligation to obey just laws. But I was also curious if we like maybe collectively as Christians who live in a uh, society governed by laws also have a moral obligation to enforce laws. To enforce laws. Do you, do you have an example of that in mind? Yeah, so if, like, let's say we are, uh, um, you witness underage drinking or something, something that might not necessarily be, like, a moral bad thing to do, but it is a law that we are supposed to obey. Do we as um, citizens, but also as Christians, have a moral obligation to enforce law? Well, I, I don't think you, I mean, depends what you mean by enforce. I mean, you know, uh, again, only government has the authority, Thomas says, to use coercive force on people. No private person has that authority. So if by enforce you mean, I don't, you know, call the police or tell somebody, well, I mean, it might, it might be in certain circumstances. Somebody might have that kind of a responsibility. I don't know that it's a general responsibility. I mean, if you, if you think there's imminent danger of that person getting in a car and driving drunk or something like that, then I think prudence would suggest, you know, if there are reasonable things you can do to stop them, you should. But I don't know if there's, that there's a general obligation of that kind to enforce uh, laws. Again, we, we have police departments and courts and the rest of that, and that's their responsibility. Um, so, 